Good morning. Good morning to all. On behalf of SCAT College of Engineering Technology, I welcome you all for today's webinar. Our college was established with the vision to serve the society by creating quality modern age engineers. We are succeeded in our vision and continuously serving the society for the past 20 years. Modern era needs engineers with multidisciplinary knowledge. In this context, we are organizing today's webinar on design thinking for healthcare innovation. This webinar is organized by our Department of Mechanical Engineering. Now I'd like to introduce today's resource person of the webinar, Dr. Subbaraj Karupaswamy. He did his bachelor's degree in Mechanical Engineering in National Engineering College. He received his master's degree in Advanced Manufacturing Technology from MS University of Baroda. He received his doctorate in Biomechanical Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. He undergone his postdoctoral research training in medical imaging and biomechanics at the University of California, United States. At present, he is working as assistant professor in the engineering product development pillar at Singapore University of Technology and Design. He leads the medical engineering and design laboratory, which is an interdisciplinary research group specializes in design and development of medical devices, medical imaging, and image analysis methods. His research work resulted in six patents, two books, 50 peer-reviewed technical articles in highly referred international journals, and 85 international conference articles and presentation. Before going to the session, I would like to address few instructions to the participants. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the YouTube live chat box. We will bring them up at the end of the presentation during question and answers time. Feedback link will be posted at the end of the session in the YouTube live chat box. You can view this webinar at any point on the same link. Without any further delay, now I invite Dr. Subbaraj Karpasami to deliver the presentation. Welcome, sir. Hey, uh, good morning to everyone. Okay, so hope you all are uh, doing okay and uh, hope you are enjoying your uh, home based learning. And uh, thanks to uh, Professor Alvin and uh, who kind of invited me to deliver this webinar. Okay, so by the way, I'm uh, Subaraj and I'm an assistant professor at um, uh, Singapore University of Technology and Design. So today I'll be going over some of my work on uh, design thinking for uh, healthcare innovation. So just to take you a quick background about the uh, university where I work. So the university, we are a very young university. It means we have less than 10 years old. So this year we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. So, so we have like a kind of a very different theme for the university. We are not um, separated by the departments like mechanical, electrical, electronics, or computer science like that. So. Just I'm giving you a picture that's just a train. Okay, so if you look at the train, what would you see? You cannot see anything as like okay, just a simple things as a mechanical. This is the mechanical systems, or uh, like you cannot say that this is an electrical systems or electronic system or anything. You cannot say that because it's just a product. So that is what we would see. If I take the question around this train, so what I see is an engineering product. That is the train tracks and everything. So that is come under the product category. That is what we are categorized as engineering product development pillow. So then if you look into that one, okay, how many stations to have and how far the, I mean, how, what is the time difference between the trains? Okay, everything can be designed by the engineering system. That is what in a traditional sense, what we call as an operational research or operation management techniques, what we learned in the traditional curriculums. Then we also need to know that, okay, how are we going to charge it? What kind of business model are we looking at it? Everything come under the information systems technology that is come under the service category. So we classified under ISTD pillar. Then of course we need to build the stations, the locations and everything that will come under the architecture and the sustainable. And can we use the solar energy? Can we use what kind of energies we 
to make the building better. But since we are a technology technical institution, so we also have the common core called science, math, and technology clusters. But since we our main theme is we are a design university folks, so our theme is main is a design. So we need to bring humanities and social science because we want our engineers as well as our designers to be socially responsible. So we want them to appreciate the humanity as well as arts and the social perspective of it. So we also have a humanities and arts and social science. So this is our university. So we have graduated around five badges so far. So we'll be graduating our sixth badge this year. So that is about university and uh, next is about me. So what I do. You know? So I'm basically trained as a mechanical engineer. Then I studied manufacturing. Then I did uh, my PhD in uh, biomedical engineering. So I mix uh, whatever the skills I've learned from my undergraduate, like my BE as well as a PhD. Then I did my postdoctoral research in uh, medical imaging as well as biomechanics. So I combined all of them to study the musculoskeletal system. That is nothing but a bone, muscles, cartilage. So I started with the knee. Then uh, now I'm working on spine and the neck everything in addition i also design medical devices so it range from like a braces prosthetic rehabilitation devices and also quantify the effect uh, using like advanced techniques so that is uh, my research i have engineers uh, phd students and postdoc fellows and a lot of undergraduate students who help me to do this work and uh, we publish a lot so you can check on my website so let's come to the core of today's uh, webinar. So the learning objective, what I framed uh, for this webinar is like by the end of this uh, webinar, the 60 minutes. So you should be, ha you should have like a proper understanding about the different phases of the design thinking process, which is to how to empathize with the end user, how to define and reframe the problems, how to ideate the design solution, how to prototype different uh, solutions, whatever you have to test the functional requirements, whatever you came up with by understanding the user requirements. Then you will also learn about, about how to translate the clinical needs, so whatever you understood from the clinical problem, to an engineering problem so that you can propose a proper design solution. And what are the strategies I have used and what you can devise from that one. Then you can also look into whatever the engineering principles you have learned. You have learned the strength of materials, mechanisms, thermal engineering. There are many things you must have learned uh, during your uh, uh, undergraduate studies. So can you use them to design a new product to solve a clinical problem and have a medical device project at the end of it? Those kind of questions you should be able to answer by the end of this seminar. Okay. So let's look into the medtech industry landscape. So if you look into the India as well as Singapore, so we have like a stiff competitions from the West in terms of the brands because they come up with a really excellent product and also they come up with the branding so that and then when we looked into the cost wise we are competing from the east that is china taiwan or korea and then a lot of foreign multinational companies also set up shop in india to milk us as much as possible so but if you look into the our medical uh, device industries once we come up with the product design innovations so there is a, definitely a need from the market. That is a pull is like in terms of the affordability because we have around the 20 to 40 percentage of our population at the bottom of the pyramid in the two layers. So we need to work on a design solution which would come under the affordability category as well as availability. So we should be able to mass manufacture, but at the same time, it should be highly high quality product and it should be reliable and it should be based on the local needs rather than uh, just importing a product which is designed for the western population and it should also interoperability with the existing systems and it should be innovative but if you look into the perspective of the local solutions or the technological push we are looking into a lot of 3d printing technologies advanced CAD simulations manufacturing processes advances in the imaging which would provide like a lot of details which we are unable to get to earlier and IoT sensors, artificial intelligence. There are many things are technology side pushing to innovate in terms of the product design and solutions. So if you look into the skills required to design a product for any clinical solutions, you will come across like a many things like a bioscience, biotechnology, materials, mechanical, manufacturing, electronics and software solutions. So there is a need for like a multidisciplinary translational research. We need to come up 
from the different departments together to develop an innovative product but at the same time are we are we training our engineers to be open to such an idea rather than sticking to our own silos so those kind of questions we should ask in terms of the research as well as the education perspective so when we go into the industry we should keep our mind open so that is what i would advise for the young generation so so i categorize the major pull for the healthcare innovation as a pulse so that is the poverty as well as a significant urbanization and also our lifestyle has changed what was in 1980s to now and also our population is aging so this may not be a big significant issue for the indian scenario but other countries are mean affected by this uh, aging scenario so if you look into the south asia south asia it's like almost 13 to 14 percentage of the people who are living in extreme poverty so when we design some things can they afford it will it reach to those population we need to ask the question and then around 40 percentage of our people indian population live in urban area by 2030 so that's a significant almost like a 500 to 600 million folks would be living in urban settings and our lifestyle also changed if you look into the singapore we are very small country but at the same time we are 100 percentage of our population live in a urban cities that's the highest in the southeast asia so if you look at our lifestyle what kind of food we eat what kind of uh, our activities physical activities mobilities and everything we consider we tend to be overweight we have diabetes stroke respiratory diseases because of the pollution a lot of different uh, unique type of cancers we also have a cardiovascular people die young or other way they age with a lot of diseases completely disabled they are they live longer but are they live, uh, healthier that is a kind of questions it affects that drives us to the innovative aspect of the designs what we are into so if you look into the aging perspective so if you look into in singapore perspective is like one in five citizens are aged 65 and above almost 40 percentage of our workforce is aged about 50 years old so it means like a medical cost is like almost 2000 dollars it comes into okay so that is like a pretty significant amount so i like this quote there is like a, there is an ex by the by like a bruce archer so he's uh, quoted in like almost 1980 that is a one a very old quote which talks about that exists a designerly way of thinking and communicating that is both different from the scientific and scholarly way of thinking and communication as powerful as scientific and scholarly method so it means like uh, what he was trying to say in my opinion is that it's not about always the research we talk about it it also we need to think into the perspective which is different from the scientific and scholarly way of thinking at which is a designerly way of thinking that's what i call it is a design thinking if i put the design thinking the core what i am planning to give as a lecture in this one is that how to develop the empathy for the end users can you understand what actually the end user the customer wants really wants and what is the real needs rather than what the end user says can you work in a multidisciplinary team to create the design solution what we want can you fail after early and often in a prototyping and get feedbacks to develop a proper product by the end of the design process can you develop a technically feasible and business viable and market desired solution that is what you desired because if you cannot create a viable business viable and market desired product whatever you design it is going to be shelved somewhere it is never is going to end it's not going to reach the market or it's not to reach your final audience you know so that is important to keep that is in mind that it should be business viable and it, the market should desire for your product whatever you design so the framework what i came up with it is called i3 framework there are many framework you can see online uh, and other lectures they come up with like a five phases but i come up with the three phases which are the key one i call them as identify ideate and implement that identify in the sense that it is about you need to identify what the user really want so for that you need to immerse you need to work with the end users talk to them document whatever they do whatever the activities they perform and understand the stakeholder the stakeholders are not just the end users that also comes into that what kind of manufacturing are you going to use who is going to market it who is going to sell it who are the key opinion leaders 
everything you must understand it and the early stage of the design phase itself so you will have a much better understanding about who you are going to deliver the product in. so that is need that is what you will get as unmet clinical need at the end of it but you will also have a significant understanding about the stakeholders once you have that you have the proper needs and proper functions you are expecting it out but then you can ideate to have a design solution that is like a participatory design in the sense that you 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 involve the end user during the design phase so that you can design a product what they desire rather than whatever you come up with it and you're expecting people to use it you know which is not going to work and also like uh, be open to multidisciplinary collaboration so you can have a really innovative technologically advanced solution and also you should understand what are the design constraints and the technical requirements you have then you can generate a proper design ideas and you evaluate them against the needs to so select the best idea possible to take it further so at the end of the ideate phase you will have like a really disruptive technology design solution you would have it and then you will go on implementing the design solution in the implement in the sense that i'm looking at the working prototype at the end of it to demonstrate that okay it works whatever the idea you came up with it it works and you should be able to test it you should be able to verify all the function requirements in the controlled settings so you can consolidate and you can pitch it to the business in business investors and everything to take it ready for the market so that is technical feasibility and you have viable business so you will also do like a cost calculations and everything you should be able to do by the end of this cycle so this process ends with the proper business plan and the functionally working prototype it means like you can demonstrate to the investor that yes the idea i came up with for the particular design particular requirements i have a proper working prototype and i also have a business plan at the end of it that is how it works on but even though this looks like a really linear process it means like okay i can do this one i can do this one but you never works that way this is a completely non linear process so you will when you look for like okay, what kind of problem should i work on you will come up with so many problems but thing is where should i focus so you need to have a proper screen do we have there is a, really this is a must have the need or there is is a good to have need those kind of a lot of questions you can use to prove the ideas select like a top 3 or a top 5 depends on your bandwidth so you can select it then you generate like tens of concepts for each and every need you select it you generate and then you test them okay is it fulfilling what i need it so you are going like a diverging then you are converging back you have a final concept then you are looking at okay does this solve the problem or not does it have a market viable can they sell it for proper profit margin so all the questions you would ask at this stage then you will be able to tell that yes i will kill this one i'm going to kill this one as well only one is going to be viable so i will go ahead with it so it mean you are not going to select only one needed to work on because if that fails you are gone so you need to start from ground zero it is better to parallelize the process so that you will achieve something which you desire okay so let's look into the each phase i'll give like a different examples based on my research work so that you'll be able to understand what i mean by that one the first phase is identify phase so the commercialization is necessary as i said the, as i told you earlier the business uh, viable as well as like a technically feasible and market desired solution is important to reach the end user so instead of just thinking about the inventive idea you also think about a innovative idea okay so it is important that you have to bring it with, you have to start with the unmet need rather than technology if you think that okay there is a vr technology it's a really cool technology can i use it to solve some problem it means you already identified the technology and you are trying to contextualize the technology to solve the problem which the problem may not exist it is also can happen so instead of that it is better you start with the need real need and work towards a design solution so if you uh, your problem is well defined it means you are already 50% of your solution is already existing so the foundation of innovation is shaped by starting with the great clinical need so it means it's not just about a immediate technical problem you have to look beyond it the cause and effect diagram whatever you have studied it that is that will help you to identify what is the cause you don't look at the symptoms you just to go to the cause what is the root cause of the particular disease particular effect what you see 
then you will be able to understand it. So the filtration is very key during your radiation phase. So, so again, I'm starting with one more quote. It's like a, to understand the real user that because you need to know that whether the need, what you think as a need is a really need or other is it just a, another things the patient or someone, some end user wants to have it in. So although people often cannot tell what their needs are, their actual behavior can provide you with invaluable clues about the range of unmet needs. It means you have to immerse yourself with the end user to understand what exactly the need is rather than what they tell you. What is that you have to read between the lines, you have to think about why they are saying particular questions, but how do we get that one? How do you gain empathy in the sense that how do you understand the end user to get the true needs? There are many ways you can do that one. I'm going to give you the top five, which I practice. It's about you have to observe the user's environment where your final product, what you are planning to design will be used. So you need to understand you go there, you document, you take a video, everything. You sit there and observe the whole day, do that and self-document it. Don't talk to them. You know, So those kind of things you can do it. That will help you to put the end product in a perspective that how the use the environment is going to affect your product at the end of it because that will become your design constraint or otherwise it will become a technical requirement for you so then you look into the extreme user perspective it means like okay if i'm going to design a toy would my kid sit on the toy will it break you know those kind of questions it's called extreme users category you can see that or otherwise if i'm designing a product what if it is the elderly person is going to use or 80 years old can they use the particular product? What if it is a left-hand user? Can they use it out? Do the person, if the particular person has a Parkinson's disease, so can they use it out? You know, this kind of questions, if you ask it, you'll be able to design a product which for the normal customers, they will really love it. You know? So that is called extreme user perspective. Then you will look into the analogous scenario. It means like, okay, doing in a similar scenario, can I, can I mimic a similar scenario? to understand the problem better, you know, that is analogous scenarios. Then to get into the cause rather than just to solving the symptoms, can you ask the five why questions? Simple, the problem is, well, okay, I just ran through the red light in the signal. So why did you run through? That's the first question you would ask. Oh, because I was late for work. Why were you late for work? So then you would ask, okay, I woke up very late. What went wrong? Why you woke up late instead of waking up early like 5.30 or 6 in the morning? So, oh, no, my alarm clock didn't work because it broke. Oh, why? No, because I, I forgot to check. So these kind of five whys will get you, at least the five whys will get you into the deep root of the problem. So you will know that, okay, I'm not just going to throw that, okay, I should not run the red light. That's not the problem. The problem is you're, you, have, you forgot to check your alarm clock, whether it works or it's set for the right time at the night. You know? So that is the thing. If you solve that one, everything is going to be solved. Your symptoms, all the symptoms are going to be solved. You are not going to be late for work. You're not going to wake up late. So everything is going to be solved. Not one symptom. You are going to solve like multiple symptoms along the way. So that is the one way to understand the true needs, what you want from the end users. So, and also like we all, at the time we think that, okay, we always tell that, okay, the patients or the end user, they don't know what they want, you know. So, but it's not really true in this age. So, I'm giving you some stats to showcase you that. People don't trust doctors nowadays. They think that, okay, doctors are just there to earn money rather than treat the patients, you know. So, there was a study conducted by the Philips. They share the data with the with the, with, with the patient, you know. So, it means they told that, okay, this is the... Symptoms you have, this is your x-ray, this is the reading from the radiologist, this or the everything is available. Then the patient feel like, oh yes, they believe that, okay, yes, this is a true thing, so I can make an informed decision. Then they feel like whatever the care they receive from the clinicians, they believe that they received an excellent care, okay? So if they do not have the access to the data, they can see that, okay, their rate is like a really low, they don't trust, they don't believe that they received the good care. So it means you need to make them understand that, okay, what is the true nature of the disease and what is the treatment are you providing and why are you providing? This is about empowering the patients or empowering the end user. So 
you can always trust the end user sometimes they may not tell you exactly what they want but as long as you understand you should be able to tell that this is what they truly need it you know so that is what i was giving the state so the real life case what i'm going to show here is about the patient who approached us uh, who had a four quarter amputation it means the patient lost uh, is one arm from the shoulder uh, due to like a kind of cancer mastio sarcoma cancer so there is no arm his uh, right arm is completely lost from the entire shoulder joint and arm so the needs the patient asked us is that okay the process is uh, he wants it should be lightweight and it should not sweat at the interface where it connects with the amputated surface and it should be aesthetically pleasing it shouldn't look like a polio affected arm like the one which is showing in the picture and he should be able to lock the elbow in any position this is the simple needs given by the end user so what we did in the center we chased around the user we work we talk to him we observed him during the whole day 24 hours we observed then we based on the things we observed that okay he is a frequent uh, air traveler and he also drives with one hand and uh, he doesn't uh, ask for any help to put up the current processes and also he wears a long sleeve white shirt to work every day and he attends professional meetings almost like two three meetings every day and he doesn't like sympathy for his conditions from anyone and he also goes for walk 5 kilometers every day and he uses the prosthesis for support sometimes and he doesn't want any active high end prosthetics that is what we observed it then we realize it okay even though the need given by like a not sweat at the interface and able to lock the position why he gave we really understood that one so it means we said that okay it should be temperature controlled because he walks for 5 kilometers every day so he thinks that okay because of that reason it sweats so we should have a temperature controlled since he is an air traveler he cannot uh, we cannot ask him to take out his prosthesis every time he passes through the metal detector yeah? so it should have no metallic parts and also like uh, he uses the prosthesis for support and he attends a meeting in the center he only need two positions he doesn't need to lock in every degree so only 0 and 90 degree works and since he wears a long sleeve we cannot have a prosthesis which struck the shirt you know so we decided the polish to surface to put the shirt and also we need to have the color proper color because he wears a white shirt and also like since he attends a professional meeting someone might accidentally touch his arm because they think that it's a real arm so we need to have a soft texture for a hand so that they would feel like it's a real arm so these are the re modified need we came across it this is just by shadowing the end user that's what i was earlier explaining that it is it is important that we understand the real need by observing the one we immerse ourselves into the user's environment we ask the right questions we ask the five why questions everything we applied we end up with the real needs for this particular patient okay so then we came up with the okay can we divide the problem into a design one so we came up with like four different design uh, subsystems for this prosthetic that is the interface design so the complex shape must capture it and also it should be lightweight and she should be able to self lock it rather than pulling up the shirt and lock the button so he can and the soft material hand structural design that is what we came up as a technical requirements and it will be easy for us as an engineering designer we should be able to solve this problem now better way rather than looking at as a prosthetic yes so that is the first one that is the identification of the problem and understanding the stakeholders and engaging with the end users and the clinical immersion now we need to come up with an ideation okay how do we involve the users in the design process how do we collaborate with us and then kind of what are the design constraints we would have what kind of ideas we will have you know so so when we develop when we come up with the concept we always supply the commercialization filter very early it means okay can we commercialize what would be our prom, profit margin what kind of business plan we would have can we have it as a use and throw device or otherwise can we sterilize and use it again you know these kind of questions we would ask earlier itself so the commercialization filters are applied during the concept selection process it's as well as the concept creation itself because the winning design it doesn't just overcome the technical challenges we can design an amazing technically complex design but what if we are unable to sell it because no one wants to buy it because it is really expensive or otherwise it's too difficult to use it by the end user who are like a common folks you know so 
the winning design must have the commercialization filter early. That is what we are trying to solve it in the ideation phase. As I explained earlier, instead of choosing one idea at the expense of the others, can we have a creative solution resolution to take like a pick and place some of the elements from the different ideas to create a better design solution? So sometimes like one design feature of the design one would be better than the design, uh, the same design feature of the design two. So can we take that one? Can we create a design three? Okay, so this kind of question you can ask for it. So you cannot just to ditch an idea because that one design element is not working. So can we keep our mind open to an idea that, okay, can we have a multiple designs and pick and place to create a new one, which is superior to each other, okay? So, so this is what we do in the lab, you know? So when we have an idea, we just put it into different ideas, different color codes. We talk about each design function. So then we mix and match. So we drink enough coffee and sugar, you know? So we say that word is like given enough time and sugar, we will invent something at the end of the day in the high, you know? So that's what happens in the ideation phase. So in a traditional concept evaluation phase, is that like we have a technical requirement. So we will say that, okay, the device must be delivered, but not uh, through a surgical incision. So we will assign weightage and we will evaluate the designs, whatever the design we come up with, like a design one, design two, design three, design four, we evaluate it. Then we see that, okay, where are the things go negative? Where are the things go zero? Here the zero, it means um, the baseline, whatever the design we have, or we will take the current existing solution. So that we assume it as a zero. So if the design features of the design one, which is similar as the baseline, then we will assign zero. If it is better than the design feature, then we will do one. If it is worse than the baseline, then we will assign minus one. So that is how the, the code works here when we evaluate the design. When there is a minus one, then we will look into that one. Okay, is there any other design which has a plus one or otherwise zero? For example, if I take it into the third requirement, that device must not lead to thrombic development. You know, So it means, okay, there is a design one and the design two has a negative feature, but the design three and design four are functioning the same or they are performing better. So we will see that even though the design three has the highest one, but it has a minus the last one so can i take one design element from design one or design two can i sneak it in to create a design five so this kind of questions we ask okay so that is what it comes but that is a that is a traditional design we will design evaluation we ask for it but what about in a medical one because as i explained earlier the commercialization hurdles are very important we need to tackle early so in addition to the technical feasibility we'll also look for it what is our IP position? Can we generate a new IP or can we take a license from someone else in you know, easy cost? You know, those kind of questions we will ask. What is the regulatory hurdle? Whether this is going to come into the class one device, class two device, or class three device, how long the regulatory process is going to be? Can we get away with the regulatory hurdles? And how are we going to pay for it? Is it a user is going to pay for it? Or the insurance is going to pay for it? Who is going to pay for it and what is our business model? So in addition to evaluating the technical feasibility, we will also evaluate the designs against these ones in the early stage of the design before we even start prototyping it up. So this would give us that instead of even though design four came up with the highest num highest uh, rank here, but the design five performs much better when we combine all of them. So that is the reason that we choose it up. Okay. So the commercialization filter, as I explained as a point three, it is very important to have a winning design at the end of the day. So, so we clean out uh, all these things. We'll end up with the design four and the design five. So the winning design doesn't just overcome the technical challenges, but also around the commercialization hurdles. So we need to have a business plan at the end of it. That's what I said earlier. Yeah? So. So that is that ends the phase two, that is ID8 phase. We have a disruptive technology which also has a potential business viability. So that is what we are end up with as the part two. The part three is about implementation. It means we need to fail early and often. So it means we need to rapidly prototype, iterate it, 
So we cannot go with the one approach. We'll go for a multiple approach to test and verify, evaluate it out. So there are this uh, this fellow Sturman is a complexity person. So he wrote a quote it's called "There are no side effects, simply effects to be learned from." So early in the project, it means he's telling that okay, fail early and learn from it. Okay, what it affects, you know, rather than just looking at it, how my product is going to work. You also look into that. Okay, how the environment is also going to reflect based on when I place my product into the environment. You know, those kind of questions you should ask. That is what he is mentioning about this one in the complexity perspective. So if you look into the why we are telling that failure early in the sense that what if it fails when you put the put an implant into the person, you know, so you can see that there is a news. Almost eighty thousand folks were dead because the FDA missed, or other way they didn't do the proper testing evaluation in the early stage of the phase. So these kind of things would cost the company. If you formed a company, you will bankrupt at the end of the day. Okay, so it is better to fail early and often so we can learn from it. You know, so try to rapidly prototype, rapidly iterate rough ideas and hypotheses. You take a clay. You take like a paper cut models. You take like a cardboard, or you take like a wooden ones. Do something roughly to see like a how it feels, rather than thinking about like a how I'm gonna with this work. And virtually, you can think about it. Can I do something to think? You know. So that process also works. When you make a prototype, you'll also see like there are so many challenges which you never even imagined while during the ideation phase. Are about like okay, where this is gonna fit in into the user environment? How this big this is gonna be? Can I manufacture it out or not? These kind of questions it will come. And also, when you prototype it out, you'll also you can give it to the users in the early stage. You can ask them to try it and feel it to give the feedback to you, so you can incorporate it in the early phase of the design process. So this will come under the user-driven prototyping, user-driven idea change. You can work on this one in the early stage of the design process. So you can see like uh, some of the things. Uh, my engineers and my students would do is like we prototype with the wood, just the laser cut products. Some like we just buy Arduino's to test it out. We do regular design reviews to make sure it how it works out. You know, so so I'm going to explain you with one other project is like how we iterate and how we do early prototyping and we fail early to make a better product. So this is a device for a patient for a patient. Uh, I mean, like for patients who have dislocated the shoulder, we all like we climb trees or like we jump from somewhere and we just land on our hand and then we dislocate our shoulders. That is one of the painful process. You will have it. But thing is that when you go into the emergency room to put the, our shoulder back, it takes like a uh, multiple skill personnel because they don't want to damage any soft tissues. You will end up with osteoarthritis or anything. So they will have two clinicians and one nurse to take care of you. When you go to the emergency, so they wanted it to reduce the number of manpower required to do this one. So they were asking about us: Can we design a device to safely do this process? So the major functions so when we did our user needs and understanding of patient. So this is what we came up with: Like we need to have like a 180 degree rotations to put it back, and also we need to know how much force we pull to put it back. So it should be portable so that they can move, drag along in the emergency department. And it should be reusable, so that they can they need to be disinfectable, so that we can do the sterilization. Anything we want, or other is alcohol wipe. So this is what we came up with. We had a nice design. This is the first iteration. So the huge device we came up with. You know, so we can see that this device it's like a really big device which is sitting in the bed. Some of the rooms uh, mean like a yeah, testing or evaluation rooms in the hospitals, emergency departments are not this big to have the Particular device, we realized it. So, we ended up with like iterating into so many iterations. We ended up with like a three different iterations. We learned from the iteration one, and we had a design mitigation plans. We learned two, then the third one instead of having like a huge plate, a circular one, uh, we created a kind of like a fixed plate and the rotating arms, pivoting. So, those kind of iterative design journey helped us to come up with a better design solutions. You can see like uh, how many. Iterations, how many prototypes we made, so many prototypes. We even just like buy things like pillows or like we bought a crutch and we cut it and then put it in to test it out. You know, so we can repurpose an existing designs. 
and we test with our own students and everything and CAD models to understand, visualize it. And you can also see like a lot of electronic prototyping, different circuit, different sensors, breadboarding. We can visualize it out. Once we have it, now we can see the final product it looks. It has, it, it has no, no resemblance to our iteration one. Because our prototyping, our industrial design applications, so this is the final design look like. Okay. So what I was trying to say in the sense that you have to have like a multiple iterations so that you can learn better from that one. And also like this project, again, I'm coming back to this one. You can see the different prototypes, what we have. So you can see here is like one of our early prototype with the multiple holes and everything. So it didn't work because the shirt is sinking. Then we ended up with like a kind of like a mesh kind of structures. So that gave us a better perspective. Okay. So you can see different testings we were doing with the end users in the early stage of the design phase. We're testing it out, whether it fits well, whether this is matching with the other shoulder or not, because he's uh, he got amputated when he was around like a 14 years old. It means he's now 45 years old. So, so the other arm, because he's been using only one arm, that is like a really bulky arm. So we cannot design a really bulky one. So can we reduce the size, but how much we are allowed to reduce it out so that it won't look weird? So once we done that one, now we can see like you cannot even figure it out which arm is the prosthetic arm. You know, so that is the kind of a design solution we should end up with it because the user was involved in the early stage of the prototyping, testing, and everything. We were able to deliver the final product better. So, the level one. So our final process is the business plan and a functionally working prototype. Here we ended up with the functionally working prototype. What about the business plan? What you should take care of it? So the holy grail is about you need to take care of the four elements. That is efficacy and efficiency and the user experience and the cost. That's what the four E's. Without this one, you will not be able to sell anything in the market. So what I mean, the efficacy in the sense that you must have the better outcome for the medical interventions and a more complete recovery than the partial recovery and should have less side effect. So the stakeholders are patients, clinicians, and insurance industry. The efficiency in the sense that can we have a better outcome with the lesser effort or the shorter time? And the experience in the sense that whether the clinicians are experiencing with your device, the better, uh, better experience they have, they can treat more patients. The patients are having better experience. Can it adapt? Can it be suitable? Is it reliable? That's kind of questions you can ask in the experience. Economy in the sense that is it a cost to the patients? Is the value for the money? Or can you create a viable business opportunity? Or do you have the target market by the end of the one? So your business plan also will be ready by the end of it. But we're forgetting one thing is the sense that workforce, that is our students. So how are we going to generate, how are we going to develop workforce who can design these kind of products? So what kind of education are we providing to them? So we came up with the framework it's like, can we have a course where the industry, as well as the academic, as well as the healthcare industry, that's a hospital, can they come together to offer it? So I offer a course uh, to have the student experience that the design process is called engaging. That's about, like, can they have a real world clinical problem to solve so that they can understand the real need and hands-on experience? Can they be encouraged to have like a real time, real mentorship by the clinicians as well as the engineers? Can they learn from uh, what they've learned, what the design solutions, what they learned from previous courses? Can they reflect it out? Can they leverage their experience and then to solve a clinical problem? And also, can they integrate their engineering knowledge and the clinical knowledge with a real life problem? Can they use the data analytics or the quantitative uh, solutions, whatever you they have learned? Can they have? Can we give them opportunity to integrate the personal experience? Because some of the parents or grandparents they may have had certain kind of diseases, they have suffered it. So we have our personal investment there. And also, like, can they instead of just doing a course project, can they really contribute to solve a real problem so that they can become an entrepreneur at the end of the day? You know, those kind of questions we were asking. So by that, we designed a course. Uh, it's our, our term runs on 16 weeks, I mean, 14 weeks term. So we have a tri-semester tri pattern. So it means the first four weeks, they are clinically immersed. They shadow the clinicians to understand the end user. So they talk to the patient, they talk to the clinicians, 
they also in parallel they also understand what are the standards what are the regulations in the form of lectures and design uh, activities then the next four weeks they do the first two of it that is the innovation and ideation uh, of the technology then the last six weeks they focus on prototyping it out and coming up with a business plan so in uh, 14 weeks time they will have the proper business plan and the working prototype at the end of the term so they can decide they wanted to file an ip they wanted to take a take it as a startup that is what the right so come um, some pictures I'm showing here is about like a clinician. So they come here and then they provide the problem for our student to work on. In the first class, the students can choose the problem to work on rather than they can come up with the make-believe problems. This will be much better to work with the real life problem. And also like you can see here from a 2019, we had a six teams, six different products. And we ended up with the four patents at the end of the course uh, you can see i had only 25 students they developed a beautiful product by the end of it and you can see they will have like a three design reviews to present it to the industry experts as well as the faculties as well as other students to get the feedback in early stage of the design process and also they exhibit at the end of the day so that they can uh, they will have the confidence they will also accountable for the design what they come up with and they have the they can pitch for their employers and everything they can do at the end of the course we can see multiple pictures here okay so when we did the survey what is the student's perspective of this kind of course when we trained them in that sense that we asked the question is that okay i have a good understanding about the stakeholder analysis that is the first part of it Almost all of them, almost like a 90 percentage of them, they agree or the strongly agree perspective. And then when we ask them that, okay, I was able to better engage and involve the users in the design process, here also we come up with a 95 percentage almost. So that is a significant kind of like an impact we have had on the young engineers. They will be end up in the healthcare industry. So that is what I had it. So I'm going to quickly summarize it. So what I presented so far is about the design thinking, the implementation challenge, what we come up with, any field that you have, any field you wanted to imply, apply the design to you that, you first need to know what user, end user want. Sometimes as a providers and a researchers, we think that, okay, we are better and we have the expertise and researchers. So there needs to be a balance. We need to create it out so that the, whatever the solutions we come up with, it is acceptable and it is technically feasible so for the patients to use it at the end of the day or the end users in a generic perspective. So the main takeaway from the whole uh, design thinking perspective is that commercialization is a necessary step. So innovations, not just the invention. So apply the commercialization filter very early. And also, as I mentioned, the clinical need, the good clinical need or the good problem statement would give you a 50% of design solution in early phase itself. So the winning design, it doesn't overcome the technical challenges, but it also overcomes the commercialization hurdles. Okay. So some of the books, the references you can uh, refer uh, from this one. So these are the books. These are good books, uh, which will help you to uh, learn about the design thinking as well as the bio design for uh, medical applications. So the medical device design, the last book, it is a very good book to take you to the market uh, level. Okay, so it will also talk to you about like what kind of a regulatory hurdles you would have to overcome and also like what kind of business model you should talk about it, everything it talks about it. These are three excellent resources you should uh, go through. You'll be able to you'll be able to understand much better. Okay. Okay, so thank you. So I'm uh, open for question. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, really, the the one hour session is a really a very good uh, thought provoking. And here there are some uh, questions uh, from the participants. Uh, first one uh, from Muthu Arasan. What is the cost of innovation? 
uh, this is from Mutarasan. What is the cost of innovation? So the cost is about cost of innovation in the sense that what is the cost? Are we talking about the time? Are we talking about the effort? Or are we talking about the literally money? So the innovation, most of the time, like uh, what we do in the sense that we just to focus on the invention that we wanted to have a really inventive product at the end of the day, we forget that, okay, there are a number of like a uh, scientific uh, science as well as the technologies are existing. So can we use it for your solution? Can we use it for your problem? Can we come up with the design solutions using those technologies to develop a solutions which would provide a much better, much better, uh, sorry, much better, uh, what is that, effect or much better uh, care for the patients? Can you come up with it? That is the cost you can think about it. So that is the reason that I put it in like a, one of the evaluation criteria is IP. So you need to also, while you are coming up with the concept, you also check for like, okay, do I, can I generate an IP or there is, can I take an existing IP and then develop it out, which would be much better. You can think about it, okay? So the cost yeah. comes in the multiple perspective, okay? Do you have enough time, okay? In the medical industry, the main challenge in the sense that once you come up with the design, you cannot directly put it to, put it into a patient to let check it out, okay, what happens, yes? So you need to do a preclinical trials, you need to do a clinical trials, and then you get certified, then you come to the market. So it is a very long time. Do you have enough patients? That's your time is also a cost, yes? So that is the question you should ask. Hope I answer the question. Yes, yes sir, thank you sir. Uh, another question from Max Finn. Uh, it is a good presentation, sir. My query, does the prototype created affect the regular growth of bone joints in arm or shoulder, etc.? If so, yes. is there any alteration that is to, to be made in iterative design? Shall I repeat, sir? Uh, no, I, I think, uh, okay, I will repeat the question so you can tell me that whether I understood yeah. the question in the right way, okay? So your, your yes, question yes, is... Sure, sir. Yeah, so the, your question is that since we are trying to create a, a geometrically and topologically similar to an existing arm, would it affect the uh, affect the resected surface or otherwise would it affect any growth in the soft tissue as well as the bone tissue? Is that your question? Yes. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sir. I, I, I shall also repeat the question. Yeah for the good understanding. My query, does the prototype created affect the regular growth of bone joints in arm or shoulder? If so, is there any alteration that is to be made in iterative design? Yes, yes. you can, you can, you can make it. But thing is that the, the project which I have shown earlier, that one is about, the there is no arm actually. So the, the shoulder is also not there. So, and the person is, he got amputated when he is already like a adolescent age. It means like he's, he was not growing anymore. So it means there was no bone to grow after that. Yes. So it is the question you should ask. If it is, what if it is the what if it is a ch child? So what if it is the patient, the child at the age of like ten? For boys, the growth happens between like a twelve to fifteen. For girls, it happens between like eleven to fourteen. So in that time, they also going to grow. So you will have to take care of that into consideration. But the thing is that this is an internal prosthetic. It means you can easily replace it. But if you are talking about an internal prosthetic, then you have to have a multiple, multiple requirements you have to take care of it during the design phase itself to make sure that, okay, can I express while the patient, when, when the patient grows, the other arm also should That kind of question you should take care of it. That would be my answer. So hope I answered your question. Did I? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Another yeah. question from Sandil Nadan. Yes. What are all the drawbacks or risk of manufacturing setup while do massive production? What are all the drawbacks or risk of manufacturing setup while do massive production? Okay. I I understand the question. So the thing is that okay, for to to manufacture a medical device, you will have to each and every every element of the supply chain, including like a, where you buy the material, 
and uh, what can who made the material everyone must have the certification called iso 13485 certification so that ensures the quality of the material and also the manufacturing process what kind of tolerance you will be able to achieve by the manufacturing process and what is your quality control at the end of the day are you following the six sigma protocols and what are your failure rates what is your quality control quality check everything you make sure it that is a part of your iso 13485 certification process so without the iso 13485 certification process no one can manufacture the medical devices so if uh, someone manufactured a device without the certification you cannot you cannot ask the patient to use it okay so the manufacturing process definitely has an impact on the delivery especially when it comes into the mass production if you are looking into the low cost devices and everything mass production is the key we should be able to we should we should scale down we should be able to scale the whatever the prototype what the device we develop we should scale it so that is the challenge you would come across when we go for the manufacturing Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Again, Mutharasan uh, is asking a question. Sir, uh, what type of metal uh, used to make uh, this kind of the prototype? What so type of metal used to make mm -hmm. this kind of the prototype? So, when we do prototype, we use like wood, we use aluminium, or otherwise, we use like uh, simple 3D printing, any of the 3D printers, like even the $300 3D printers. Whatever we have, we used to make it up. And in the early phase, when we tried to check for the form factors and everything, we use clay also. We use clay, we use cardboard boxes, everything we use in the early stage of it. When we go for the beta level prototype, we tend to go for like a hardened aluminum or otherwise we tend to go for a stainless steel. That is the prototype we make it. But to go into the implantable or uh, clinically, clinically clinical trial ready version, we must have a biocompatible material. Either we should go for a titan or a cobalt chromium. So those kind of material we need to go for it. We cannot use any of the pro any of the prototype what we used. We developed it up. So we must make sure that it is biocompatible. It doesn't irritate the skin. Or if you are going to implant it out, it doesn't generate any other foreign body particles inside so many things we need to consider it out so the material choice will come when you go for the scaling up for productions so when we are testing out for a technical feasibility and viability and everything we test it out with a quick rapid prototyping which is simple aluminiums or wood or just a 3d printing any of the clay any of the material whatever we available we use it up for prototyping purpose yeah, thank you, sir. Another question. This is from Siva Saravanan, uh, yes. Paramasivan. Sir, uh, the presentation is really excellent. In this entire journey, do you also involve business analyst teams who are I healthcare domain? If so, yes. what is their involvement? Yes, we do involve them because the thing is that as I explained earlier, that first when we do the identifying the good need, the good need also has the component is called market because the business analytics they would help us to study the market and also they will give us like okay this is your primary target market this is your secondary prime market that that would give us very clear understanding is about whom are we targeting at the first stage to create a viable business so that also would determine that whether it is a good need to take it to further or otherwise let's kill the need and look for another need because it is important because Without the viable business, there is no use in like spending your time. This goes into the first question of the cost of innovation. You know, you can innovate it, but if no one is going to use it, then there is no point in innovating. Yes. So the business analytics they do play a key role in the early stage of the design process. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, uh, Ganesh. Ganesh and the, yes. the webinar is very nice as we engineer must know the medical science before design the implant of for joint no you don't need to know the medical science because thing is that when we are 
working with it that is the reason that i was highlighting that you must have a multidisciplinary team it means you would have a doctor as a part of the team your clinicians the thing is that why i always insist that the doctor or the clinician the end user to be the part of the team in the sense that you can design an amazing product and you can tell you can ask you can you can you can say that okay yes i have created an amazing product to a patient and and can you use it no one is going to believe you because you are not a doctor so you must have a clinician who would become your leaders and also you can tell your product in the clinic to tell you that okay yes there is offer the value this product offers the kind of the treatment you are looking for to the patient so that they would become your ambassador to sell the product in the market also they would be able to give you all the medical knowledge or anatomy physiology biomechanics background everything they would give you you are there that is the reason one of the file one of the things i was highlighting in the sense that would you be able to convert the clinical need it into an engineering problem that you can solve it you are solving this as an engineering problem thank you very much sir your feedback from the clinical perspective have i answered it Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, uh, he is asking, can you suggest some uh, ideas to develop student project in the development? Can you suggest some ideas to develop? What I would suggest in the sense that, do can you go for? I mean, like I would suggest you to go for a short internship during your summer or. Um, something to a uh, hospital you don't need to go for a paid internship or anything go for an internship and shadow around the clinicians or a physiotherapist or a nurse or anyone in the clinic you will get tons of ideas tons of ideas okay so rather than me suggesting an idea i would suggest you to immerse yourself with the clinicians in any hospital any hospital it doesn't matter how big the hospital is okay you will come across at least in a single day you will come across 10 problems minimum 10 problems will come across which would help you to on okay so artificial organ development the concept organ development people are working on it they are like a kind of a biotech technologies those kind of technologies people are working on it so yes you can work on it. so the student project in the sense i don't know what is the timeline are you expecting it out are you looking for like a one year project with a full time as a master thesis or are you looking for a phd level project that would define the scope of the problem you can look for so to check for a needs or ideas i would suggest you go for a short internship even if it is one two months you will come across you will come across with so many problems available in the clinic because if i take you indian scenario there is many problems Resource settings because some of them they don't even have enough resources. Advanced technologies. So yes, you, this would help you to look for problems. Okay, that's what I would suggest to you. Okay, rather than just looking for ideas, go and immerse yourself. Okay, yeah. UG level project. He is answering as an UG level project. UG level project. Uh, I, i cannot think of an immediate idea that which you can work on in a ug level project i think i would suggest you can uh, you can email me you can i, I have the website link and email uh, link you can email me i would be happy to talk to you also i think it's a good job yeah. so please go ahead yeah sure sir this is the last question sir uh, yes. sir is there a uh, is there a big scope for automobile design industry what do you mean by big school for automobile design big scope or a big school big scope big scope of course automobile scope, scope. 
Oh. Automotive industry is like uh, because this mobility is a uh, personal mobility is a really hot topic. Yes. So that is the reason that you are seeing like, uh, so many Tesla. Why Tesla is uh, Tesla is highly, I mean, uh, highly valued. So, yeah. So you can say that automotive industry has a huge scope. So no worries. Okay. As long as you are good with your technical skills and everything, you are your value. You'll be in high demand. Okay. There is no field which is bad. Okay. No field is bad. It has a significant scope. Okay. Yeah, thank you for very much, sir, for your uh, answers. Yeah. Uh, uh, let us, there's a time for what up, thanks. Sure, please. Greetings to all. This is Dr. Sundara Rajan, Associate Professor from Department of Mechanical Engineering. On behalf of SCAT College of Engineering and Technology, I am honored and lucky to have the opportunity to propose a vote of thanks to those who have directly and indirectly contributed to this online webinar organized by our institute. At the outset, I thank our resource person, Dr. Suburaj Karpaswamy, Assistant Professor, Engineering Product Development Pillar, Singapore University of Technology and Design, for his wonderful and valuable presentation on Design Thinking for Healthcare Innovation. We are really enlightened with your knowledge and presence. Thank you, sir. We are thankful to our Honorable Founder Chairman and Managing Director for their continuous motivation for organizing this kind of the technical webinar session. I would like to thank our General Manager Development, Assistant General Manager, Principal for their enthusiastic and consistent support. A special thanks to the organizing committee for their unflinching support and coordination. I would like to thank all the respected active participants who have blessed us with their presence. With these warm words and a kind message, we move to the end of the today's webinar. Kind attention to the participants. Feedback link is provided at the chat box and description. Feedback also carries a small assessment hope this will enhance and trigger your knowledge. Kindly fill, fill it out. After submission, you will receive the e-certificate through your registered mail. Once again, I thank all for your cordial cooperation. Let us meet on next webinar soon. Be in contact. Thank you all.